thanks for having us. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to avoid you. So, uh, um, we wanted to talk to you today about um, the design process itself and how it can work and complement governance in your businesses. Um, I just want to ask one quick question. So this is the first show of hands, and I promise I'll only do it once. Um, are any of you managing what we would refer to as a design system within your businesses at the moment? Okay, we'll go backwards a step. Do you have a style guide that you refer to and use when you're putting together digital products? Show of hands on that one. Okay, style guides, but not much design systems. Okay, good, then this presentation will be entirely relevant to you and hopefully very helpful. Um, so myself and James work for Miram. We're a global digital design agency. So we focus on building products and services and communications for companies like yourselves. Um, and essentially what we're passionate about is helping you express your brand as an interactive experience. And here is the obligatory slide which shows you the kind of people that we take a lot of pride in doing our work for. Um, the main thing that we gets us up in the morning we really enjoy is, is essentially change. And given the nature of how digital is impacting our lives and the consumers that we build products and services for, um, change is rife, whether that's the devices that they're using, whether it's the nature of their behaviors, whether it's their needs, their pain points, their requirements. Um, we have to deal with this. Um, it's exciting. It's, it's what makes our jobs interesting every day. Um, there is a pro proportion of the work that we do that involves change, which is not so nice. And if we're honest, something which we probably don't enjoy. And I'm sure you'll all empathize with this to an extent. Um, I'm not going to talk about process, but it does ha unfortunately have a negative impact on what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, whether that's uh, a common understanding of agile or fragile, as I like to uh, uh, call it, um, when the review points will be, when the stakeholders are going to get involved. I'm not going to go on too much about that, but lack of governance is something which we come across day in, day out, and it can actually have quite a tangible impact on the work that we do. Um, if I just summarize good governance as understanding what everyone's roles and responsibilities are within the projects, it helps us enormously because it allows us to focus on the things which really matter and help us to deliver quality work for you. We don't really want to be getting too involved in tactical debates around issues. What we'd much prefer to be focusing on is the underlying strategy which hopefully the entire business has agreed upon and is there to drive what we do. And good governance helps support that. So therefore, it's incredibly important to us when we're working with people like yourselves. Um, as a designer, customer insight and data is incredibly important to me, incredibly important to our agency as a whole. It what's, it's, it's what drives us, it's what inspires us. It helps give us assurance that we're fixing things that actually matter. With good governance in place, it makes sure that we can stay focused on the customer. We actually spend time listening to the things that are important and delivering solutions to address those pain points, let's say. With all of those things in place, it means we can spend more time collaborating with each other and developing ideas to solve those pain points. Um, and then as the market continues to change, we can continue to respond quickly and appropriately. So although governance is a relatively large, big thing, which perhaps not a lot of people like to talk about on a day-to-day -day basis, our view is, is that once you get it right, once you invest in it early, and let that underpin all of the work that you do, what you can avoid is this reincurring of costs and debate about what you should be doing, why, when, and who's responsible for doing it on an ongoing project by project basis. So for us as an agency, building digital products and services, governance is really important. There is one particular aspect that we do as an agency um, that can actually help governance work better within your organizations. And it's design systems, hence my question about who is managing them. A design system is essentially a collection of components and the holistic guiding principles um, that hel helps you release digital products and services to market. Okay. If you go and Google design systems, you will notice a huge amount of content that's been written about design systems over the last 12 to 18 months. 
my day-to-day -day is, is constantly talking about this, working with the team, figuring out the best way in which we can do it. These are four examples of four very big companies who are investing a lot in design systems. So we've got Salesforce, Google, IBM, and Shopify. Google's probably the one to be the one that you're most familiar with. These are all of their websites. These are all publicly accessible um, websites. These are their design systems. These are the component of parts, the guiding principles, the digital interactive representation of every single product that they create. And I sort of lean towards Google because even that top website in the right corner even feels like a Google application on your phone. They call their design system material design. It is essentially the DNA, the fabric of everything that they put together in every single product that they develop as an organization. It is the manifestation of, of their brand. So there are a number of components to design systems um, and reusable components, quite similar to a style guide. Um, but essentially, it's a single source of truth of every single element that makes up a user interface. Something that any number of design teams or stakeholders can refer to to see how to make something in an application or a website. Now, style guides have done that in the past. But what a lot of us in the design community like to think of as how design systems are different is the guiding principles. Clearly articulating how those components and those patterns come together to create things that feel like a branded product. So this little illustration on the right-hand side is what Google uses to describe its sense of space and structure in every single uh, product that it makes, the depth by which buttons interact, the feel that you elicit from the, the user interface as you use a Google product. And that runs through every single thing that they design and build. If you like, therefore, it becomes a... Oh, that's nice. That's definitely not my stomach. I, I made sure I ate. <laughs> I have, I've got a large appetite, but it's definitely not me. Um, if you like, it therefore becomes a manifestation of the brand. Um, this little illustration on the right-hand side here is from Uber. Um, it's the Uber ice cream campaign. Have I gone? No, I'm okay. Um, so they have their core, um, their core design system, which relates to their, their kind of core products. But the important thing is about the Uber ice cream campaign is what they were able to do is take the essence of their design system and then just evolve that in the right way that, so they didn't lose the essence of what an Uber product feels like, but they adapt it to a new communication style. A really important thing about design systems is it brings together the design and development community. Um, I can't stress how important this is. A style guide, the main thing that's been problematic about style guides, let's say, even if they've been, trans if they've been produced in a PDF format or shared via a website, is the human element that is introduced between a design vision and a concept and a set of illustrations, and then how that translates over to the development community. Unless your communication is absolutely 100% crystal clear, the translation from one to the other can introduce problems. The principle of a design system, how it's architected, how it's put together, it's very much derived from the designers and developers working together. So it's very much a holistic product as opposed to something that's design-centric and visual and kind of graphic design-based. The other important thing about a design system is if you're putting all of that effort into building something which is meant to be hugely scalable, is going to govern the nature of every single product and service that you deliver digitally as a business, is it needs to be incredibly well shared and communicated. And I think this is probably the, this is the one most important thing that will make a design system a success in any large-scale business. You have to get the stakeholders on board. They have to understand the value of the system and what, and what it's there to perform on behalf of the business as a whole. OK. So one of our clients um, that we're working with at the moment is Fiskars. Um, and we've developed a design system for Fiskars as a whole. But Fiskars is made up of multiple brands. So in this instance, we have um, Fiskars covering products, for everything from scissors. We have Gerber with 
for all the guys in the room, you know, incredibly lightweight, really intricate, inter interesting sort of Leatherman multi-purpose kind of tools. Um, and then we also have Wedgwood on the right-hand side. There's a design system that underpins every single one of these websites. We're getting a huge amount of reuse between components, but at no point are we sacrificing what each brand needs in order to express itself accordingly. So there's a system, but it's not constrained in the creativity of each representation. Okay, so obviously we're obsessed with quality and detail, and I, prom I promise this is, I won't geek out too much on this, but there is something very interesting that underpins design systems, and pretty much nearly every single agency that if you talk to them, if they're any good, will uh, perhaps talk to you about something called atomic design. It's actually a really simple concept. It's just, unfortunately, we spent a few too many years not doing this. And it's about how you bridge the gap between design and developers and do it in a very easy to understand, practical way. It's about nesting and hierarchy. It's kind of like Russian dolls. Have one, start with something small, nest in something bigger, create something bigger. It's a book written by a guy called Brad Frost who comes from a design and a development background. Um, and this little video here is the easiest way of showing what I mean. So you have something called atoms, which are the smallest components on your website, something like a button. And then they're formed together with fields and labels to create something like a molecule. And they're formed together with other molecules to create something like organisms, like a header on a website. Those are your components, those are your parts. You put those together to create templates, your homepage template, your product template, your press release template. And then your te templates are uh, filled, essentially, with content delivered by Crown Peak, of course. Um, the important thing about thinking about the design and build of a digital product in this way is that systematic approach. In order to achieve this, you have to get your designers and your developers to agree this hierarch hierarchical system of components. The great thing about this is, is that once you've done that, from a business point of view, you've created a system that can scale and adapt as and when it needs to. Thank you. So, um, Sam talked very eloquently and beautifully about theory and philosophy and beautiful things like that. I like to get stuff done. Um, and unlike Wade here, um, get you know, out of virtual reality into reality and actually get stuff shipped. Um, so I will just quickly spend a few minutes talking to you about the way that we do that and the tools that we use and maybe some ideas you can take away uh, and maybe implement yourselves later. Um, so there's some cool, cool tools that we use, like I say, and you know, there's some, some things that I've learned in the last 20 years of doing this and um, big issues we, we find in our teams are you know, about quality, collaboration, uh, working in silos, you know, developers and creatives, and you know, everyone sort of arguing, you know, against each other on the way things should be done. And what we try to do is harmonize all those disciplines together and, and, and it foster collaboration and, and increase the quality of what we're doing. So we have some, some core cool tools for doing that. No, we don't, because that's the wrong slide. There's the slide. I can't see it from here. So um, who uses Photoshop? Anyone heard of Photoshop? Right. So anyone use Photoshop these days? Anyone do development? Right. So we don't use Photoshop anymore. We use Sketch. Sketch is the new kid on the block for doing layouts and designs, and we use it for creative and for experienced designs. Um, and what it allows is, is a collaboration almost immediately at the point at which you create the interface and the design for creators and developers to sit together and actually work out how it's going to fit, out, how it's going to fit together and how it's actually going to operate. We use another tool called Zeppelin, and Zeppelin uses the output of a sketch file um, in, a, in a format that is understood by developers, less designy, more developing, but the same file, um, and then they can then start to collaborate even more at that point um, it really is the glue in between creativity and actual getting stuff done. Um, and then the getting stuff done is Pattern Lab. And Pattern Lab is a, it's a prototyping platform that allows you to see very quickly a, a design come into life. And it's another, get, and, and another opportunity and excuse to collaborate again. And that's more, more client friendly, less, less developer teams, um, more clients, I say. So, how does it work? So, in process wise, in a sort of standalone deployment pattern, uh, those of you familiar with Crown people will understand what that means. Um, a fairly standard content management process where we have um, Sketch, 
creating the design, automatically generates the Zeppelin file. The Zeppelin file is then used by front-end developers into Pattern Lab and then built. The problem is that we have with this integrated content management system uh, pattern is that to get it from a lovely, beautiful front-end design into a content management system, you usually have to hack it, hack the hell out of it until it fits. With all these different steps, which looks quite onerous, um, there's a number of checkpoints that we can put in place to make sure that everyone is, is going in the same direction. If there's any issues, we can then quickly push those issues through the pipeline and get stuff fixed very quickly. And the same would happen then with um, the consumer deployment platform for headless or content as a service pattern, got an old pattern, um, if you're delivering into multiple channels. Um, but we've got the same tools and the same process applies there as well. So what does it look like? So this is Sketch. Um, and as we talked earlier about atoms and molecules and organisms, um, as this video plays, hopefully it plays. Yes, it plays. Um, the, what the design has done here is split out all those individual elements into reusable elements. Even at the point of design, we start to reuse from the moment we get going. So here we're taking all the way from um, elements of the page through page layouts and then ultimately to a style guide that we can then export into the next tool. So this is Zeppelin. This is what developers see. Um, and with no effort at all, we can see immediately the color palettes and the typography we're going to use on the, on the, on the final product. Even down on the, on the right-hand side there to the styles that we've pre-agreed between the developers and the creatives, what they're going to use and name things. So we've got naming conventions nailed from day one. That's a real problem. And fonts, you would not believe the amount of hassle we have with fonts. Getting to scale is a real problem. It's worth it. Yeah. Um, and then another developer view. So not only have we got the, 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 the typography nailed, we can also use this tool to see exactly the dimensions that the, the designer needs for their design. So those doing Photoshop would have spent hours and hours with calipers trying to get dimensions and things like that. We don't need to do that anymore. And again, if we, you know, another view of this would actually see down into the detail of the style, the actual layout, the actual <coughs> module that we're trying to reuse. And then for um, the Pattern Lab, so this is a, um, a Pattern Lab. This is actually fractal not Pattern Lab, but there's, there's a few tools to do it. It allows us very quickly then to prototype that look and feel. And again, in a real working website, we can quickly see how all those elements come together, where the code we use is coming together. And if this is going to be turned into a, a star guide, we can actually copy, and copy directly from this as like the, 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 the source of truth for all front end design um, and uh, all the digital channels. So a very, very quick checkpoint on that tool as well. Um, yeah, so we've got one. One process, one set of tools, it doesn't matter where it's going, all follows the same stuff. So governance from that perspective, we've uh, pretty much covered off. Um, mm -hmm. And you are going to take this bit. Yeah, one last slide. So um, essentially what we're looking at is a design system which is incredibly well planned and thought through from all of the relevant people that are going to be continuing to work on it and own it. With that in place, thinking about this kind of this notion of governance within the business, that has the potential to take away a huge amount of pain and time and unnecessary change from businesses like yourselves. If you have that system that you can fall back on, it means you can iterate products. It means that you can spend time focusing on the things that really matter. So on two levels, let's say, iterating a pattern to get it to work better. When I say a pattern, something on a website that actually performs an action. Um, as you learn about how that needs to, needs to perform and solve and better address user pain points, you can advance that and push that back into the system. But at a fundamental level, any new changes that you as your business need to be responding to into, as I say, a fundamental change in behavior or technology in the marketplace, you consequently have more time to focus on the more strategic things that matter to your business rather than the digressing horrible little details of managing and unmanaged website that doesn't have a design system to underpin it. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the more you can kind of consider that how design systems can play a role within your businesses, um, the better. Cool. Thank you very Thank much you. for listening. Thank you.